You are listening to Ask an Asexual. This is part of the Ask a series, a short-run podcast dedicated to breaking myths and stereotypes by asking real people. I'm Sheena, and I'm joined today by author and podcaster Heather Rose Jones and author Alex Woods. Thank you both for joining me today. All right, so today we are giving you a guide to including asexuals and common misconceptions by allosexuals, and we're talking about representation in fiction. It's a very jam-packed episode. I hope you enjoy. So let's talk about including asexuals. Alex, what do us clueless allosexuals do that makes you feel excluded? When I'm actually am surrounded by other people, <laughs> which doesn't happen so often, <laughs> the discussions often drift into uh, the first thing that always pops up is how do you want a relationship? Why are you still alone? Do you even seek out someone? Most of my friends don't really know that I, that I am asexual because I think it's something that I don't go around and have a sign on my head saying, hey, I'm asexual. It always drifts into this very, very personal part that when they get to know you and you say, yes, I want a relationship, but I'm not interested so much in a sexual relationship. I don't go and sleep around. All these questions that are normal for, for sexual people, the best thing you can do is pick another topics pick topics like what movie have you seen last or what did you do on your holiday or how are your children and don't go into these deep personal questions because it's like you have a target on your back that is saying as soon as i open up myself and say no i'm not this way they hone in on you <laughs> <laughs> nothing else matters they ask so deep personal questions that they don't often even realize that they are doing alex you're very involved with the lgbt group where you live right so you're out i'm out as a lesbian yes but you're not out as an asexual no because i think it is something very deeply personal for me that I don't want to go around and portray because I don't even know how I can portray it because it's <laughs> it's like like my friends are saying uh, you are you are ten footer you can see from ten feet that I'm gay <laughs> but uh, you can't see that someone is asexual and it's only something I w- I really share with close friends of mine because nobody has to write to know what I'm doing in bed or what I'm not doing in bed. Okay. So for you, being lesbian is par for the course, but being an asexual, because it's so personal for you, you don't share that unless it's with close friends or on podcasts. Exactly. <laughs> it's the with same the whole thing world. With, <laughs> it's the same thing with I'm, uh, I'm non-binary. I, I think uh, I don't have to explain to everybody whom I meet and have conversations with that I'm, hey, by the way, I'm gay and I'm non-binary and I'm asexual and I'm disabled. And <laughs> I don't think it's something I would go around and I, I don't want to, because I have the experiences that people ask you more and more questions, deep personal questions, because they think they have the right to. And it's not my place, I think, to be the one that educates people. Yeah, it's like the hitchhiker that I picked up once uh, where I casually mentioned in conversation that I was lesbian. And the next thing out of his mouth, and, and I have to emphasize this was not like a, a scary or weird situation, but the next thing out of his mouth was, so so what do two women do together in bed? That's like, where the hell did that come from? I mean, what, what in the world makes you think that that's an acceptable next question? <laughs> it's like um, a good friend of mine, he is gay and he works as a nurse in an uh, intensive care unit. Right at this unit, they have often personal coming and going because it's not staffed very well. And as soon as someone new comes and they sit and they eat lunch or they eat dinner or drink coffee, 
the the first thing they ask them is how it is to be gay, what he do, what he how he met his boyfriend, how he knew he, he was gay, and he was like, why can't I just sit there, and we can talk about what I did, what I what movie I'd watched or what dinner I had with, last night with my boyfriend? Why do I need always? to answer these questions that are deeply personal to me, that people don't have this barrier to say, okay, when the person doesn't want to answer your questions, shut up. If they talk, let them talk. But don't, like, probe them like they are an alien (laughs) that has fallen to Earth. (laughs) And it's not just a question of the direct personal questions. I mean, what I would say to people if they want to make a more friendly world for asexuals is in general in your life, think about where am I assuming that everybody else in the world thinks the same way I do? You know, I, I have a, a good friend who had the unfortunate habit of no matter what the topic was, she would turn to you and say, well, as we all think or as we all believe or we all agree on and this was like, you know, social stuff, this was art criticism, this was history, this was politics. And somehow, I, I think it, was, it wasn't a sincere belief of hers, because if you called her on it, she'd say, oh, yeah, no, no, I don't assume that. But, but it was like a verbal tick where, you know, no matter what came out of her mouth, she gave you the impression that she assumed you thought and locked up with her. This is something that a lot of people do in general. But when it comes out around asexuality, people don't even think about how they are expressing the opinion that everyone experiences sexuality the same way they do. And so they turn to you at the restaurant or in the bar and they say, oh my God, did you see that woman? Don't you want to jump her bones? And it's like, uh, well, no, actually. I mean, she's she's pretty. Okay, I, you know, I can see a certain elegance there, but no, I don't want to jump her bones. It's like, what the what? What in the world is wrong with you? Or yeah, so I was, there's a podcast I used to listen to that was author interviews. And as a ritual thing, at the end of the podcast interview, they would always go to the author and say, okay, fuck, marry, kill. Which characters do you fuck, marry, and kill? Uh, and I'm thinking, it's like, okay, I'm never going on that that interview show. Because what what what, that, what 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 is this? You know, why do you assume that everybody wants to fuck one of their characters? And... And it's even subtler than that. You know, you see a lot of online conversation in lesbian spaces that just assumes a high level of sexual desire on the part of everybody involved. And it it actively excludes you. People actively say, you know, if you are not turned on by this book, you are dead. You know, or if you you aren't even human, if you don't respond to this, you know, this sexy scene. And it's, it's, it's that overt sometimes, people using language uh, in hyperbole, perhaps, that says, if you do not experience sexual desire, you are non-human. You are a robot. You are, you know, just not, you're, you're not part of society. And if you call them on it, they'll say, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. But it's so ingrained in how people interact and just, as I say, the verbal tics, the, ver- the automatic things that people say, the ways people talk about movies, books, TV shows that assume sexual desire. And if you want to make a friendly space for asexuals in your community, you need to start thinking about that. Just in the same way that, you know, you think about not saying, oh, that's so gay about something being bad, or you don't say, you know, oh, he's retarded if you just don't like his behavior. It's the same sort of thinking about the implications of what you're saying and how people around you are taking that. Especially when you look to, like, let's let's take Lesvik, um, because I try to, like, be with in book club read, and when recommendations come out, just to be able to um, to follow the conversations and participate in some conversations. And um, I have uh, read and downloaded some books and audiobooks I otherwise would never have picked. And when uh, some are writing, oh, this and this is so hot. And I was literally several times sitting on my porch, listening to some books, listening to some sex scenes and like, 
I should I should really I should really do this and this. Oh, I have to uh, not interested at all because I don't see the point of all um all of this um conversations because I just don't understand it. And if we look to TV series um portrayals of asexuals, the one thing that still sticks out out of everything was an episode of House where he had uh, two patients um, that were saying we are asexual, we love each other, we are married, but we don't have the desire to sleep with each other. And it was so poorly written because it was written like, no, it must be something medically wrong with these persons that they don't have the desire to sleep with each other. And I was like, how, how as a doctor can you, can you say this? How is this even possible? And what writer did write this to say that no, it must be something wrong with this person's brain. That's why you don't have the desire to sleep with each other. Then you have the character, the popular character of Archie Comics, Jockett. He was originally uh, written as an asexual that he loved his friends and he liked to hang with them and be with them but he doesn't have the desire for romantic relationships he's aromantic and he's asexual what they of course changed completely in this absurd tv series that was made or is still made on netflix because you can't have an asexual character you can have a gay character you can have a lesbian but you can't have an asexual it's impossible um, the last person I think about is uh, the Harry Potter series. He is not named so often. He, uh, his name is Charlie. He is the oldest brother of uh, the twins. What the, what's the name again? Weasley. Charlie Weasley. Charlie Weasley, exactly. He's written... It's not officially said that he's an asexual, but um, J.K. Rowling said in an interview that uh, she doesn't see Charlie as gay, but he's more interested in training and being with his dragons than he is in a, rom- a romantic relationship. And when she got prodded a little bit more, she didn't say it openly, but she said, well, he's just not interested. He is more interested in training his dragons. Uh, <laughs> and then it turned to like, yeah, can he be gay? And she's like, no, Dumbledore is gay. Because like, there can only be one. Yeah, we can just have one. <laughs> Media hasn't still done the right thing in portraying an asexual person, sadly. Yeah. And when you look at, you know, getting back to lesbian, because that's sort of the context in which we all met each other, I'm fine with reading books in which characters have sexual relationships. I'm actually fine with, with reading sexual scenes in uh, in the books, as long as there's some good plot and characters to carry it along. I mean, it's 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 when the story is just window dressing to have some sex scenes that it's like, I didn't need to read this. Exactly. <laughs> but there's there's a definite strain among people, especially lesbian readers, of thinking, if there is not on-page sex in a book, then it's not a good book. It's certainly not a lesbian book. And that even if it's clearly indicated that the character's are in a you know a, a, an active and and happy sexual relationship if people don't get that sex on the page then it's like eh, you know why'd you waste my time this isn't this isn't a real lesbian book i mean i get that a lot only one of the characters that i've written is on the asexual spectrum the rest of my characters are allosexual and they have very active sex lives they just are not having sex on page and the reactions I often get from readers are, well, this is just, I, I can't believe in this romance. I, th- there's no chemistry here. I don't buy this. You know, they, I don't see what they see in each other because they're not having sex on page. I mean, that's always implied. And I've had people say outright to me, it's like, well, you know, I really kind of liked your books, but, but they failed for me because you didn't give me sex scenes. For me, that just totally invalidates the possibility of, a not, of an asexual character. That if you if you have to see it on page, even if you know the characters are sexual, then what are you going to think when I'm writing an asexual character? 
Oh, unless, of course, it's one of those, you know, I am going to educate you about asexuals and explain it all to you stories, which I'm sorry, I'm not going to write one of those. Of course, in the beginning, when I was younger, I read this typical lesbian fiction about coming out stories. But now as I'm older, it's not something that really interests me anymore. And I don't want to read it either. <laughs> I've read so much that is just circled around sexual relationships and nothing else. And I rather have a really good storyline. I have nothing against when there are some sex scenes, but a good storyline that really follows the characters. <laughs> it's like one of my favorite humor authors to read is Robin Alexander because she's just she just writes hilarious. Sometimes I think she secretly follows me around with the drone with all the shit that happens to me. <laughs> because I'm just this person. Things happen to me that usually not happen to other people. <laughs> and uh, I recognize myself a lot in, in the humor she writes. In some books she has quite a lot of portrayed sex scenes, but they don't disturb me because it's something that uh, helps the plot along and shows a deeper insight into the characters. I, I really hope in the future that there is coming more out for us people who are asexual that can more relate to the stories that you like to read. To clarify, you're happy to read lesbian fiction as long as it's got a great storyline. So do you tend towards looking for books in your general interest, whether or not it's got se sex on the page, or do you tend to shy away from sex on the page? I have nothing against it, no. It should be the center plot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For me, it. I mean, I have such a hard time finding books that totally hit my sweet spot in the first place. I'm certainly not going to avoid a book if it's got a significant erotic content. But what I find is that books that focus on erotic content don't tend to hit my sweet spot in other areas. I know that I said at the beginning of this series that I feel self-conscious and private about talking about my own personal sexual involvement. I'm going to say right out, it's like, I've got a set of books on my bedside table that are out and right porn and that I use for sexual gratification. You know, this is complicated. You know, and that's not unusual for asexual people. It, it, the asexuality is about desire as provoked by other people. But when I'm reading for reading pleasure, as opposed to other kinds of pleasure, it's just not part of what makes it for me. It tends to get in the way. Uh, so it's it's not about an absolute thing. It's more like, you know, different reads for different purposes. Okay. For what it's worth, I'm not a huge fan of erotica in any shape or form. And frankly, I can take or leave sex scenes on the page. If if the sex scene itself either teaches me something interesting and new about sex or furthers the character storyline, I'm all for it. Otherwise, honestly, I'll probably just think it's, it's bum fluff that doesn't need to be in the story. And I'm a big advocate of exactly that. I don't think that there has to be sex on the page for it to be a good book nor do I think it has to be that way for it to be a lesbian book. The only criteria for me for lesbian fiction is to have a leading lady who's either lesbian or bisexual. That's it. I have nothing against um, uh, my friends, people talking about sex and so on, but I just, I can't, I can't relate to it. And as I said before, I was um, the sexual health um, person at, uh, our LGBT <laughs> group and I had to sit through a lot of seminars everything from BDSM to I, I don't know even what and I was sitting like there and making notes and back and forth and everybody was like talking about their personal experience and I was sitting like that I have no idea what you're talking about but I made notes so if somebody asks me something I have a note about it <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think that when people focus on specific types of physical experiences in books, that they tr can train themselves away from noticing a lot of the other ways that books can establish relationships. 
you know, again, getting back to my books, but of course it's, you know, it's what I pay attention to how people read them. You know, I have seen people claim that there is no sign of attraction between Margaret and Barbara in Daughter of Mystery until the very end of the book when they finally get together. And I'm thinking, it's like, I can cite you, you know, in every chapter, there is an interaction between them that indicates their, their growing, you know, romantic attraction to each other and their physical response to each other. And I, I know because I put them in there. And if you're missing them, then, then that says to me that you've got this, this very narrow idea of how people build re- relationships and how they, how they respond to each other. And if you've got a character who is on the asexual spectrum in a book, and you are trying to show how they how they are developing a romantic attraction or how they are enjoying the type of physical relationship that they enjoy and people are attuned to only seeing this very narrow spectrum of behavior as being related to interpersonal relationships then they're going to miss that they're going to they're going to say it's like well no there was no romance between these characters well how can you say there's no romance because they didn't do x y and z and x y and z are the only things that count for romance and and of course, then you know, taking that out of the book and back into you know so, social interactions, it says to me that if you believe that X, Y, and Z are the only way to build a romantic relationship, then then you you've cut me off entirely. You know, you've said that that I am not capable of, of engaging in a romantic relationship because I'm not interested in those things. Of course, that gets into the other issues of can asexuals and allosexuals successfully date. It, it, it gets back to what are the things that where you've decided this is the tick box that needs to be ticked. You know, this is the thing that defines being present and active in this sphere. One of the things that was unpleasant for me when I went to the GCLS conference was the way in which there was this ritual sexualization of interactions at the conference. You know, everything from if you were first time attender, they said, Oh, you're a con virgin. And they would, people, everybody, not, not just the convention, but everybody would make these very sexualized jokes, teasing you for being a con virgin. And oh, we're going to de virginize you. And I can imagine somebody being allosexual and finding that uncomfortable if they just feel that, you know, sexuality is, is a more private matter. But as an asexual, it really made me feel Excluded. Even something like when people have talked about, you know, at that particular conference about, you know, how can we make things more welcoming to people? How can we make people feel more included? And there was this big, you know, discussion and movement about it's like, oh, we need to make sure that everybody gets properly hugged. You know, just come to me and I will make sure that you get hugged by everybody. It's like, well, okay, hugging is not necessarily a sexual behavior, but not everybody wants to be hugged, you know? And and for me personally, in addition to being asexual, I, I'm kind of like picky about physical contact. And so saying you are going to welcome me by sending people to hug me, well, that's kind of the opposite effect of what you claim to be doing. So it gets back to the whole thing of don't assume everybody wants the same thing you want and be open to, you know, the true golden rule, you know, do unto others as they would want done unto them, not as you would want done unto you. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that when people say, you said you uh, you have written a romance between these two characters, but I don't see anything of it. Just because not every uh, second chapter they're falling into bed with each other. I, I had a, a fascinating experience with the, the no- a novella that I have out on submission right now, which was deliberately written with an aromantic protagonist. This was sort of the whole linchpin of the plot is that she is not going to fall in love. She She's just not oriented to fall in love. It's a, it's a Beauty and the Beast retelling, so this is kind of key to the plot. The story is all about her developing some really strong friendships. It's about the we'll kill and bury bodies for you type of friendships. It's about her becoming a heroine and triumphing and coming through in the end. And one of my beta readers said, oh, I was so unhappy because she doesn't get her happily ever after in the end. I was like, did you, did you even read the book? You know, she does not end up in a romantic relationship. That is the whole point. 
that does not mean she does not get happily ever after. It was like the discussion after Disney's Frozen came out. Why does Elsa not fall in love with somebody but she can't have an happy ending because she has does, doesn't have a guy? Nobody really got that she wasn't even interested in it, that something else was uh, more important to her. Yeah, oh my god, can we talk about Elsa as a as a asexual icon? Yeah. I mean, if if that movie awesome. had come out when I was a teenager, oh my god, I would have been such a fangirl for it. And I might not even have known why. I was why. like, this is my Disney movie. <laughs> she lives also in the land of ice. <laughs> Uh, the cold never bothered me anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so should we say in terms of romantic plots for non-romantic characters that people should just let yeah. it go? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. I think that that's a good episode. Oh, that's a perfect wrap-up. You have been listening to Ask an Asexual. I'm Sheena and I was joined today by Heather Rose Jones and Alex Woods. Check out the show notes to links about things discussed in this episode. If you enjoy this podcast, then come and talk to us on the Lesbian Talk Show chat group on Facebook. You can email us on podcast at thelesbiantalkshow.com or follow us on Twitter at Lesbian Talk Show. You can also join our community of patrons and get exclusive content. Go to patreon.com slash thelesbiantalkshow. The link is in the show notes. Find this and other exciting podcasts. All you need to do is search for the Lesbian Talk Show anywhere that you listen to podcasts.